negotiating firewood prices to designing a boat. Main extracurricular was making video games. So my parents had said, you know what? You can't play games very much, but you can make them. When I was a freshman in college, I was entering game competitions and I made a game called Escort Wing that won a competition. It won me a job at a game development studio, it invited me to join him and to make software for the iPhone. And I was making, I don't know, 12 bucks an hour doing work study at the library and he offered me 50 bucks an hour and an iPhone. When the App Store launched with only 500 apps, one of those I had gotten to program. An opportunity to learn iPhone programming and a piece of resume that at the time nobody could really match. And they started recommending me to other people. And before I knew it, I was busy with as many apps pretty much as I had time to make. Met someone who later became my business partner and sort of led us in the production of a contract software development. And we separated due to differences of opinion, maybe 10, 15 apps together for a variety of clients. It was sort of freelance consulting until starting Future Proof Retail uh, with my partner Didi. A lot like a marriage being in a business because once there are assets and responsibilities, you're really stuck in it together. You start to pick up a spider sense that probably saves time even if each line you type is slower. Say, hey, we're starting a bus company. We're gonna build the cheapest bus we can using contractors who say they can do it for half as much. In the multi-line situation, they started calling our name at the gate and we had to abandon our purchase. I that camera-based was not gonna be scalable or efficient for a long time. Uh, and even today, five years later, we see there's a lot of camera-based solutions out there. It is not a lot of live stores where you can use it. Inspiration from Netflix. When they launched, the internet wasn't fast enough for most people in their homes to be streaming video. But they didn't want to just sit on the idea and do nothing. Yeah. So they built a business that transitioned seamlessly into it. All right, what is the Netflix version of this business? How do we get into enabling what we want as consumers, which is never to have to wait if we don't have to, right. um, without having to spend 10 years, build these huge training sets. Let's build an app. The app needs to figure out where you are. It needs to know the prices of everything. It needs to let you pay. It needs to handle loss prevention. Sometimes their technology stack has grown piecemeal over time and they don't have a super clear picture of what's connected to what or how it's all working. To provide them this software as a service, we also really had to go in and set it up for them and help them figure out their own systems, map their own networks, integrate some of their own stuff. Life-changing actually is a quote that we've pulled from some of the customer feedback. You walk into the store, it knows where you are because it has your GPS. You hit start shopping, it gives you a scanner. You just scan products in front of you. It goes beep, beep, beep. When you're done, you hit check out your credit card or Apple Pay, whatever. Your payment is approved. A big light above you goes green, makes a happy sound. You uh, walk away. We figured everything out the hard way. Yeah. In grocery, micro markets. Uh, we do the Staples Center Stadium in LA. How do you know if a shopper just pretended to pay and is walking out looking at their phone and looking right. satisfied? We just sent a clip of the person walking out with the bag of groceries right to the manager. He goes, oh my gosh, oh, move the team out to California should... while we were taking care of this first store pilot. Just push it out right past the line. And he said that the jealous looks he was getting from customers made him want to give them that experience. And LinkedIn's a great place to get the word out, exactly match all of the pricing that people get at the register because everybody is going to expect that. So we worked through all of those kinds of issues. How do, we, how do we match it correctly? How do we handle the bottle deposits? Because we honestly didn't know what we didn't know. Started making most of our revenue in the last 18 months and we're a SaaS model. Customers who pay a fixed monthly fee for unlimited transactions, and then we have customers who do more of a mix where they have a small monthly fee, and then they pay a fixed fee per transaction. Raised 4.3 million for the company to date. Had to transition from writing code to writing emails. The sales cycle uh, in the retail tech industry is around two years long. We do a lot of due diligence around what you can connect to technologically, et cetera and then you start with a pilot. Try it in two to three stores, yeah. you know, and then we'll see where we go from there. Started adding stores piecemeal here and there while we were really focusing on improving the product, waiting that we're in the grocery space, and then we started expanding into other spaces. Hong Kong is not a difficult place to do okay, business. Coming. The progress of this interview, we're always making forward progress. Yes. Feels good to be uh, walking. Always on delivering the best experience. And in this sector, what we do, mobile self-scanning, there have been many very unsuccessful attempts. Prove the base shopping experience, make it faster, make it easier. Communication is a much more important skill than I ever realized. Today we're 10 people. I would encourage anyone who is watching this in New York to go and try the Fairway app. Uh, if you're in Hong Kong, check out the Scan and Go stores there. Uh, in Chicago, try any of the Plum Market locations. California, there's California Fresh Market, uh, El Rancho Market in Belgium. 
check it out at one of the Spar or the OK stores there. Welcome to Startup Hunter, Will. And I'm also streaming on YouTube and lots of other places. Will is here with Future Proof Retail, which is frictionless checkout. And I don't know what you know, but what I do on this show is I explore your entire entrepreneurial history from birth. Okay. So starting at the beginning, Will, where were you born and what did your parents do? Uh, I was born in New York City. My mother is an artist and my father is an architect. Now does he run his own practice or firm? Uh, he used to, he mostly teaches now. So there was, do you think any of his entrepreneurship rubbed off on you? Did you go into the firm when you were a kid? Uh, I would have to say most entrepreneurship lessons come from my mother because she had an amazing work ethic and she really focuses on getting things done in a practical sense. From my father, he uh, always encouraged me to believe that things were possible and, and he helped me to see that actually, you know, there is not such a huge gap between the people who are captains of industry and the people who are doing everything else. Uh, for most of us, we have a broader range than we realize. Okay, so I too am a city kid and one of my most recent interviews was with a city kid. <laughs> so you, it's really sort of difficult to sell lemonade in a situation like this for safety reasons, um, <laughs> for get off the street, you're blocking traffic reasons. So what was the first entrepreneurial thing you remember doing? So I didn't grow up in New York City. I was born here. Ah. Uh, I lived in Cambridge, UK until I was eight. Yeah. And then Rhode Island until 18. And then I came back to New York and I've been there since 18. The first experience I had with entrepreneurship was working for a local arts organization in Rhode Island called Waterfire. And they would put on these enormous, beautiful displays in the summer evenings where they would light braziers all down the river and have coordinated music and boating and it was just a, a wonderful thing to do and I was the assistant to the director which meant that I got to tackle a wide variety of random tasks ranging from uh, negotiating firewood prices to designing a boat. My boat later sank. It wasn't my fault it caught on fire. Yeah, how did it catch on fire or do you not want to go? I wasn't there. Did, I don't know. Oh, okay. I heard about it afterwards. Wow. <laughs> um, but at any rate, so my first exposure really to entrepreneurship was through this arts organization where everything is grant driven. So it wasn't so much about getting revenue in, it was more focused on delivering a fantastic experience and product uh, and on that side of things. What age were you while, while you were doing this? Uh, 17. Okay. And do you go to college? I did undergraduate at uh, NYU Gallatin. Yes, which is a school of individualized study. It is, yep. So. What uh, topics did you graduate, um, gravitate to? And also, uh, what kind of extracurriculars were you involved in here? Uh, so, my main extracurricular was making video games. Yeah! I was a fan of video games as a kid. Okay. But I was very limited. Now, what, what games did you like? In availability. I liked shooting games, I liked strategy games, I liked building good? games. I just, I liked the computer. I love computers. I oh, love... So, so computer video games, not Super NES? Yes, actually I never had a console or a Game Boy or anything but a general purpose computing tools. So uh, what were, they, like, were you like Sim Tower? You know, Sim Tower was all right. That was an okay game, but it was that kind of era. Yeah. Um, I was in maybe third grade, I guess, when I discovered games. Yeah. Uh, and so my parents had said, you know what? You can't play games very much. Uh, maybe some periods at all, maybe I was bad, I don't remember, uh, but you can make them. So this encouraged me to start teaching myself programming as a kid, oh, so and I also went to a school that had programming lessons for middle schoolers, which super, was pretty cool. Super interesting. And so give us, a, give us a date. Maybe 2001 I was getting into this. So th these were still I-686s, Pentiums. I, we were a Mac family, uh, but yes. this was pre-power PC, starting with System 7.51. Sure, I remember System yeah. 5, I think. Oh wow, or even before. Not even Mac OS 10. So you're you're making games on a Mac. So you you said started in third grade, you started programming. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, uh, it's basic programming, you know. Programming ranges all the way from making the turtle move to stuff I can't even describe. So. It's like saying you started writing at age three yeah. or something. Oh, yeah, maybe you did, but let's see if your writing was any good. Yes. Uh, so what was your favorite game that you made? When I was a freshman in college, I was entering game competitions as a hobby. 
and I made a game called Escort Wing that won a competition. It won me a job at a game development studio, uh, a bunch of other free stuff. Which which studio? Freeverse. Okay, and what do they have a big title uh, like like Doom or something? At the time, they made all of the standard games that were on the Mac. Uh huh. So when your Mac shipped with, uh, well, not all of them, a chunk of them. So basically, every Mac user was playing some of those games. I, what were the What were those games? I, remind me. Because they're all mixed in together. They did a big set in the kind of uh, board games. They they did fun stuff that were kind of uh, appropriate for all ages and um, very focused on sort of inherently enjoyable, juicy graphics. Uh, you know, and they transitioned very, very well into the mobile age, too. Yeah. And another big mobile publisher. It's cool. We won this video game competition uh, to make games. Yep. And then, by chance, a couple years later, yeah. uh, someone who had played the game and, and heard of the competition and knew the iPhone was coming out uh, soon by the name of uh, Josh K. Uh-huh. Invited me to join him and to make software for the iPhone. And I was making, I don't know, 12 bucks an hour doing work study at the library, and he offered me 50 bucks an hour and an iPhone. Uh, and at that time, my phone was a flip phone that didn't even have a camera. So iPhone's already 2007. Yeah, a couple years have passed here. Uh, I think I'm maybe a sophomore in college, or a, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, and so the result, thankfully, to Josh uh, was that together we had made some of the first apps so that when the App Store launched with only 500 apps, one of those I had gotten to program. No, no, uh, remind me again who Josh was? So uh, Josh K and his brother David K are... Oh, I know them very well. That's maybe how we know each other. Yeah. Yeah, they are uh, fantastic entrepreneurs and inventors and developers and in general, uh, Josh, by inviting me to make iPhone apps with him, set me on a path that has been very good for my life since. So he just gave you a phone? And money to learn how to program it. Uh, yep. And he was not a big operation at the time. This represents, you know, a, a really uh, wonderful thing that happened. So that's really interesting. These two brothers are sort of they're legendary or really nice guys. And I uh, haven't seen him in a while. But um, so what did you do with the iPhone? You said you, say you, made, you started making some apps. Did you, um, you make them all? Did you, he say, like, we didn't have to do this? Or did he give you autonomy, do whatever you want? No, he had a design. Uh, the first app we made was Mr. Shuffle. And it was, uh, you take pictures of your friends, and then you use the pinch and the zoom with two fingers to position props on them and put thought bubbles in their mouths and then send them the image. <laughs> so and this is really this is really early iPhone app store when the Ford app made a million dollars. No, this is earlier than that. This is before the app store launched, we submitted it. So on launch day, this was one of the only 500 apps in the store period. That is so freaking smart. <laughs> now, did you, I remember when iPhone launched, I don't think there was in-app purchase. So was it monetized? Was it, was it free? It may have been through both phases. I don't totally remember. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure the App Store did launch with the ability to sell apps, though. Right. Uh, maybe just not with subscription. So what was, do you, did you launch that app as a for-pay app only? I actually didn't handle the launch. Yeah. So I was just the programmer. Got it. Uh, on that but it gave me an opportunity to learn iPhone programming and a piece of resume that at the time nobody could really match. And there was all of this fervor for developing apps. Here in New York, uh, most of that was being driven by local ad agencies. Yeah. And they were thinking, oh my God, we're gonna sell apps to all the brands we work with. Exactly. So, so you, did you stop working with Josh and David? I collaborate with them various times on different projects. Um, and actually, the next project came from a, a computer science professor that I had at NYU. Okay. And he introduced uh, a fashion brand that was looking to produce apps for their uh, collections every year. And which, I started doing that. Which brand? This was Eli Tahari. And so you, you make an app for them. And uh, how did adoption go? So if, if they employed you for a few years, it must have not totally fallen flat. Oh, no. It went great. And they started recommending me to other people. And before I knew it, I was busy with as many apps, pretty much, as I had time to make. So Sometimes a few more. So were you, you were a personal app developer. Did you ever uh, scale your operation and bring on other people so that 
Uh, you're more of an administrator, or did you just sort of stay a bespoke? I gave it a try. Yeah. Uh, so as I was graduating college, a couple apps down, sort of getting into this app thing, um, I met someone who later became my business partner and sort of led us in the production of a contract software development business, taking what I was doing independently uh, and what he had been doing with Facebook and mobile app, uh, social apps independently and turning it into a, you know, a proper business where in theory I wouldn't develop that much of the stuff myself. Uh, but it was a tough business and in the end we separated due to differences of opinion about how to do business. And uh, in that process we had grown and done maybe 10, 15 apps together for a variety of clients, yeah. some of them which did very well. Uh, and after that period of time I went back to doing consulting on my own. Uh, and it was sort of freelance consulting until starting Future Proof Retail uh, with my partner Didi. So talk about the difference of opinion between you and, and your co-found business partner. I think it's very common for business partners to have differences of opinion and it's extremely important that partners always be aligned uh, around their values. Um, it's a lot like a marriage being in a business because once there are assets and responsibilities, you're really stuck in it together. And how you handle that stress together and, and how you tackle sort of uh, the big decisions and the ethical ones and those sorts of things uh, need to be aligned. And my partner and I felt differently. So was anything codified in, in a contract or you did say you, you, you parted ways with him. Did you try to reconcile with him or was there just no? It was a, you know, a mutual parting. Uh-huh. How long in, in total were you just uh independent or just doing iPhone development before future, future proof retail? Uh, let's see. I'd made more than 30 apps and future proof retail started in the very beginning of 2014. Yeah. So about uh, seven, eight years. Yeah, about seven years. And these are, I would say these are the prime programming years. You know, you're, you're, you were probably, what, tw how old were you in 2007? 2007, minus 12 years, maybe 20. Right, so, so you were 20 in 2007. Or 19 or 20, yeah. Right, which is, a, a, having been a programmer, you know, I definitely know that certain abilities, like your ability mm. to muscle through a problem, you know, just the brain power sort of changes around 27, 28, 29. Hmm. I, did, have you found, well, you're sort of right approaching that. Uh, well, yeah, I guess my, I don't think that the mathematical or the algorithmic or sort of natural abilities decrease or that there's sort of a prime programming age that's necessarily younger. Uh, and part of the reason I feel that way is because one of the very best programmers I ever met was in his mid-60s. Yeah. And he had just started on IBM mainframes but just kept up to date every year with newer and newer stuff. Yeah. And it was uh, kind of inspiring to see somebody really bucking that trend of, you know, are you younger people better at programming? Exactly. And I think what comes in, if there is a decline perhaps in, in raw speed yeah, or that's... something like that, it's more than made up for by an increase in intuition. As you've just run into more and more problems and seen how different projects can become derailed, uh, you start to pick up a spider sense that probably saves time even if each line you type is slower. Well, yeah. I mean, I think the reality is that younger people are willing to work for less and older people are not willing to work for those same prices, even though they're better and worth every penny, uh, if they're decent. Um, so I think that's part of the, the reality, too. It's very, very dangerous to go cheap on programming. Oh, I mean, you, get, uh, you, you get what you pay for. You would never expect someone to say, hey, we're starting a bus company. We're going to build the cheapest bus we can using contractors who say they can do it for half as much, yeah. plus my cousin who says he, you know, built a car once, <laughs> you know? Like, this is your product, this is your startup, this is what you believe in, and uh, the quality of the code, the issues that arise with it may not show up for several years down the line. But what I do now in helping retail businesses often involves interacting with software uh, that has sort of passed its age limit. Now, before we even get too deep into, future, into your day-to-day -day future proof, I want to know the story of it. Sure. So you said your co-founder was Didi? Yes, and we were traveling together at an airport. 
and we were trying to buy a bottle of water from one of those Hudson News. Yeah, uh, rip-off stands. <laughs> um, well, it's the whole airport. Yeah, the whole airport uh, is a rip-off stand. <laughs> you have no choice. Actually, I was in LaGuardia recently, and they had a sign <laughs> on the uh, fridge of expensive sandwiches. Uh, this was a you know a no-name brand of uh, store, and they said basically. Uh, these are standard prices for Midtown Manhattan. Yeah. And it was like they had been facing the complaint so many times, they just stuck it on there. Now, what do you think is more expensive as far as price gouging? A sports stadium uh, food prices or a airport food prices? Do they take away your water on the way into the stadium? Uh, I'm sure they'll... I mean, I went to Mets game for Memorial Day uh, two years ago, and I didn't, I didn't bring... I, I don't have enough data to know, but I would suspect maybe. Definitely a football game. Uh, a football game for sure. Uh, I would guess the food prices are higher at the airport, actually. Yeah. So... Anyway, we're at this Hudson News. Yes. And they're trying to help us, but three lines of people have formed around a kind of central cashier stand. There's not a clear order in which people are supposed to be helped. Yeah. And they're calling our I name know, at the I gate. Know, actually, I know the whole three line situation. Oh. Because I, like, if I got there first, really was there first, and then somebody comes like two minutes later and starts their own little line, <laughs> and I'm like, excuse me, I was here first, and now I see you making some kind of move, and, and I really have to go, and I would appreciate. So I'm very familiar with the multi-line situation. Mm. <laughs> well, in the multi-line situation, they started calling our name at the gate, and we had to abandon our purchase. Yeah. And if I'd had cash, you know, maybe $5 or $10, because it's the airport, I'd have just stuck it on the table, and walked away exactly. with a bottle of water. Exactly. So we're sitting on the plane thirsty, and I had just been uh, consulting for this startup Augmento, which later became Flyby, then Shimmer, and then sold to Apple. And what we did there was we did uh, products around camera recognition, especially of packaging. Uh, but also what they did that was very impressive was around uh, motion recognition uh -huh. from the camera. But the uh, experience that I had had at Augmento with recognizing products through cameras and developing products around that functionality led me to believe that within 10, 15 years, it was going to be possible to do this relatively easily in airports uh, and other highly camera observed areas. Uh huh. So at the time, uh, what we were describing is later what Amazon has uh, prototyped in Amazon Go, for example. And now there are other startups that are taking that camera-based approach uh, in order to try and make frictionless checkout happen. So I want to know, you went from the airport story where you first came up with the idea or you were with Didi. So yep. how, tell me more about the inception of the idea. And was it was it right at that airport where you go to Didi? Yeah, so we actually, we wrote a plan on the plane. Cool, on, on, on cocktail napkins? On an iPad. Uh -huh. and, Which is digital cocktail napkins. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the plan basically said, look, camera-based is going to be a powerful way to do this because we were in the airport and we were uh, focused on it. Yeah. But we also recognized that camera-based was not going to be scalable or efficient for a long time. Uh, and even today, five years later, we see there's a lot of camera-based solutions out there. Uh, and it is not a lot of live stores where you can use it. So, so you quickly determine it's too computationally and technologically difficult to do camera-based? The issues with camera-based are less about computation and technology and more about configuration, handling edge cases, and building a sufficient training set. Okay, so before we even really get into like what the problems are, what was the actual uh, MVP that you sketched out All in right. the cocktail napkin? So we, we took inspiration from Netflix. Netflix Right in the name, obviously it's going to be on the net, right? Uh huh. But when they launched, the internet wasn't fast enough for most people in their homes to be streaming videos. Yes. And I think I heard Netflix is like 20% of all US traffic, or maybe that's YouTube, but video on the internet clearly was a, something that required infrastructure for them to get there. But they didn't want to just sit on the idea and do nothing. Yeah. So they built a business that transitioned seamlessly into it. First, they ship you the uh, DVDs by mail. Right. And you've got the account, and you're going to the website and picking your movie. And then instantly, one day, they just flip a switch, and now you can play the movie on your account. Exactly. So we said, all right, what is the Netflix version of this business? How do we get into enabling what we want as consumers, which is never to have to wait if we don't have to, right. um, without having to spend 10 years, build these huge training sets, 
Uh, I don't know if, if anyone watching has heard what Amazon has spent on their uh, I'm sure it's stores. There's, there's <laughs> varying estimates. Okay, uh, now we're talking about the Amazon Go. Uh, Go concept store, which is in Seattle. There's now one also downtown in New York. You say we need to, we need to make people wait less. So what was your MVP that you first tried? So we said the simplest possible thing is to have the customer just scan the product with their own phone. The product has a barcode on it. Phones are good at reading barcodes now. And every year as the camera quality and the speed of the phones gets better, the same barcode reading algorithms get better too. Uh, so we said, all right, we'll just build an app. The app needs to figure out where you are. It needs to know the prices of everything. It needs to let you pay. It needs to handle loss prevention. Uh, and then you can transition this into any other checkout method you want in the future because the customer is already registered. They have payment information in the system. They have transaction history, etc. All right, so you, you have a thesis, right? Having a thesis is one thing. How do you go, and I assume you go and build an MVP, but then how do you actually go to a store and which store did you go to and say, here's this totally different way that we want you to do business uh, and how did that go? So we were coming from the consumer app space where we're very good and we're able to make really that shopper experience great just from using our own experiences as shoppers. And we also worked with testers, uh, including Didi's grandma, who uh, was an excellent tester because she'd never used an app before. Pitch that we went with to grocers off the bat was probably a little bit naive because we were thinking of ourselves more as a tech startup with a nice little SaaS product that they can just buy and enable this amazing function. Obviously, this should be a no-brainer, right? I got my first meeting with the owner of a 10-store grocery chain in the area. And uh, I went into the meeting and I'm gonna have him try the app because we built it first, we had everything running. We were on you know, version 1.1, I guess, when we were going out to pitch it. First thing in the meeting, I say, okay, get out your phone. And he pulls out a flip phone. Uh huh. And, and I just had to say, oh my God, imagine you were a person who likes apps. <laughs> to a guy with a flip phone. <laughs> yeah, to who I'm trying to say, your customers want this in your store. Okay, and how, I'm, sh I'm sure, how to, did, were you able to save that meeting? Um, no. Okay. No. The, the two big, things that make adoption difficult, especially for smaller retailers, uh, is that A, oftentimes their technology stack has grown piecemeal over time, and they don't have a super clear picture of what's connected to what or how it's all working. Uh -huh. And so uh, fear and anxiety about changes is very reasonable, because right. they don't totally understand the implications it could have. As is natural over 20, 30 years, you keep adding pieces of software to your system, you make a fix that works for now, planning to come back to it later, but you never come back to it later, and then that guy no longer works there, so nobody knows. Uh huh. So the first thing that, that I think we encountered that we realized had to shift the way we were coming at the problem, especially smaller retailers, are not their own technologists. And in order to provide them this software as a service, we also really had to go in and set it up for them and help them figure out their own systems, map their own networks, integrate some of their own stuff. And I want to give a shout out here specifically to two of our clients, uh, Colret in Belgium and Fairway in New York, because this is what I'm describing does not apply to them. They had fantastic tech teams. I love the people we work with there. Yeah. Um, and they have been some of the easiest clients we've had. But there's lots of other more difficult clients. And, and while they are difficult, I think if you are willing to take the initiative to do those fixes, they'll be sort of grateful and maybe even loyal to you and then a lot more open to uh, working with you and, and, and actually implementing your world changing product. Uh, life changing actually is a quote that we've pulled from some of the customer feedback. Really, I want to know about the first time that future proof retail was, was actually put into real life use. Sure. And where was it and how did it go? Like, cause here's what I'm thinking. You scan a barcode, you walk out of the store. Like, how, is it on the honor system? Like, how does it how does it actually work? Sure. So I'll describe the shopping process, and then I'll give you a brief education on retail loss, and then the loss prevention process. Uh huh. So the shopping process is really simple. You walk into the store, it knows where you are because it has your GPS. 
You hit start shopping, it gives you a scanner. You just scan products in front of you. It goes beep, beep, beep. When you're done, you hit check out your credit card or Apple Pay, whatever, and you hit pay. And you walk up to the front of the store and there's a QR code on the window on the inside. Uh -huh. You scan that QR code and if your payment is approved, a big light above you goes green, makes a happy sound, you uh, walk away. So there, there's, a, there's a physical notifier. Um, How about we go up a little? Right. So, so you get a physical, now this beacon, yep. right? You said this green light, was that day one on your process? Or did no. you figure out the hard way that you need to have the beacon? We actually, we figured everything out the hard way. Yeah. Like I said, we were great at consumer apps, but we didn't know retail. And the last five years, uh, a lot of the work we did was in educating ourselves around a bunch of different sectors of retail. Now we're in grocery, micro markets. Uh, we do the, the Staples Center Stadium in LA. Uh, we have fashion stores. So uh, we're covering a wide variety of different Are retail there... experiences now. And it's always based on the things that you have to adjust to fit that particular store format. Are there any stores near us? The, right, right here that we can try it? Sure, if we kept walking up this street another 30 blocks, we'd run into a fairway. Okay, that's and, the closest uh, store to us right now. Yep. Fairway, for those of you who don't know, is a really established, very popular market in New York City, started in the Upper West Side, and, and really in the last five years, it started branching out and expanding. Uh, so my they, they pretty much had one store for like 50 years. One thing that we discovered the hard way was that you need a, a way to broadcast what are essentially digital push notifications in real life to people who are not looking at their phones. Uh, and the case for this is, how do you know if a shopper just pretended to pay and is walking out looking at their phone and looking right. satisfied? Yeah, tell me, give me a story like a shopper, <laughs> you know, <laughs> pretending to pay and then how did that uh, unfold? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the system just detects, right? You scan some stuff, you didn't, you didn't finish. It sends an automatic email that says, hey, you know, what happened? Legitimate reasons include, ah, someone ran out of battery, they were with a friend and they just gave their stuff to their friend, they changed their mind about their purchase. Uh, but obviously, if you don't reply to this email, it gets escalated to be investigated by a manager. And because the app records the timing of everything that happens, uh, we just sent a clip of the person walking out with the bag of groceries right to the manager. He goes, oh my gosh. Oh, so wait, you're tied into the store security camera? Um, it, we do it a couple of different ways. There's a lot of different models we use because we always have to adapt to the retailer's specific system. Yeah. And or do you usually, use, yeah. Do you do the, use the camera right on the phone? No. The for loss prevention, the cameras are in the stores. Uh huh. Uh, at any rate, he goes, "Oh my gosh, that's one of my employees," and uh, he lets her go because second or third time, I think, trying to walk out just with the groceries. Uh huh. And uh, after he let her go, he found out that the uh, mixture of cash and checks that people were paying with at the store had changed dramatically. And that actually over the last 10 years, she had been using some sort of a scheme at the register to enter fake checks and take cash. Uh, and they estimated that they had lost several hundred thousand dollars over 10 years. From one person? From one person. <laughs> and we caught her in three shopping trips with our system. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, no, was she, so you got to be kind of a dumb criminal to take your picture in the app and use the phone and tie geez. all of your crime, you know, into your identity. That's insane. So th what was the first store that you went live in? Sure. So the very first store we went live in was uh, California Fresh Market in Pismo Beach, California. So did you fly? Were you living here? Did you fly out there? At the time, our team was only five people. We were renting a conference room in New York City, a windowless conference room. For the same price, we were able to get a beach house on the beach, as in like <laughs> the water came up to the house. Yeah. And so we moved the team out to California while we were taking care of this first store pilot. That's been so it was pretty fun. I assume you flew out there before to go around, literally just not go into some stores and you found one that was uh, receptive. No, it really goes the other way. So um, what we do has lots of impacts on a store that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Like, for example, if your store uh, ever has a sticker that says like a dollar off, uh -huh. the app's not going to know about that. The cashier is manually typing that in. Yeah. So they need to change that workflow. Everything needs to be digitized and cleaned up in the data, etc. We actually, we don't go out to people and really push on them and say, you should buy this, you know, get the, get the product. 
uh, we rather we market and we allow the people who are early adopters and innovators who are already out there looking for this kind of stuff to find us. Okay. And in this case, the owner of the store, uh, Alfred, who is a, a huge tech enthusiast and an engineer, um, it's a family store. He has three of them. He came to us, yeah. and his story is fascinating because he owns the store. So he would just fill his uh, cart with groceries and just push it out right past the line. And he said that the jealous looks he was getting from customers made him want to give them that experience. Now, but how did he find you? Because like, here I am imagining you're a very unknown startup. Like, how are you, how are you getting the word out? I believe we were connected through LinkedIn. Yeah. And LinkedIn's a great place to get the word out. You just find the publications and the people that are most influential in your space. Yeah. And uh, if they're people you get along with, make friends. And if not, if you can still comment on their posts, and this is going to expose you to their audience and vice versa. Wow. So really intelligent, very efficient. What are some of the kinks that you that you sure. worked through besides the beacon? Like, what, what, are, what are the other great things that you've that you've learned from and that now you've corrected? Um, well, like I said, on the operational side, there are a lot of little corner cases that you want to figure out when you roll out to a grocery store. These stores have maybe 50,000 products stocked on the shelves and they have freezers where maybe phones lose signal. They have signage that's clashing with everything. They have a variety of custom discounts and you need to be able to exactly match all of the pricing that people get at the register because everybody is going to expect that. So we worked through all of those kinds of issues. How do we, how do we match it correctly? How do we handle the bottle deposits? Um, how do we make sure that this is uh, you know, matching all of the local laws around taxes, etc. cetera? Um, and I don't want to get too specific about the lessons uh, because I do think that they represent important trade secrets. Sure. But I will say it took us two years of really, we, we frustrated a lot of shoppers and a lot of staff members in the process because we honestly didn't know what we didn't know. Were you charging a, a fee from day one? No. No. When did you put a revenue model in place? We actually started making most of our revenue in the last 18 months. And we're a SaaS model. We have customers who pay a fixed monthly fee for unlimited transactions. And then we have customers who do more of a mix where they have a small monthly fee and then they pay a fixed fee per transaction. So you've been in business, what, five years? Yep. Did you just, you said you had a team of five. Have you? Did you bootstrap this? Did you pool so, up with friends and family? Did uh, you find it professional investors? So my partner, Didi, uh, focuses on the business side and I focus on the technology side. Yeah. Uh, and through her efforts, we, she raised 4.3 million for the company to date. The business side of it, you're, a tech, you're like a technical CEO. Yeah. Interesting. It's uh, uh, been very interesting for me because it's the first project where I really almost none of the code, maybe at this point, none of the code that is being run in production have I touched at all. Yeah. Uh, and that's been both a good thing and a bad thing. I've had to transition from writing code to writing emails. Yep. And the rules are different, but it's similarly easy to make critical mistakes. And uh, there is a lot of nuance to it. And as far as a business education goes, that's been a kind of uh, nice side effect of getting this thing going. So talk about your growth over the last five years. Your first trial store was in Pismo Beach. Where did it sort of go from there? Like, was it steady growth? Were there periods of, of flatness? Um, talk about your growth. So the typical sales cycle uh, in the retail tech industry is around two years long. Yep. Uh, now, is there, does that involve whining and dining and schmoozing your customer? If you can afford it. I have heard there are big companies out there that take people to party mansions for the weekend if they're you know, responsible for buying, etc. But uh, no, mostly the most effective strategies have been marketing and informational. Yeah. You really need to educate people. You need to give them all of the tools they need to educate the rest of their organization internally. It's a... Uh, it's a very knowledgeable and, and thoughtful and careful buying process. And you typically do a lot of due diligence around what you can connect to technologically, et cetera. And then you start with a pilot. Uh, oftentimes a retailer will say, oh, you know, hey, try it in two to three stores, yeah. you know, and then we'll see where we go from there or we set some targets. Uh, so after California Fresh Market, uh, we started adding stores piecemeal here and there while we were really focusing on improving the product. 
and we made enormous strides uh, right. since that initial version of the product. It was about a year later that we introduced a counter service system that allows you to uh, order from a menu online, have stuff waiting for you when you get there, be able to order in person, like if you're getting a pound of roast beef at a deli counter, uh, without having to wait to speak to the person or wait for it to be fulfilled, you'll just get a notification in the app and you'll come back and pick up a, a package with your name on it. Uh, so we added that component, which really filled in the last points of waiting that were in the grocery space, and then we started expanding into other spaces. And this so yeah, was, which spaces? Uh, well, it was driven organically by spaces that were coming to us. Um, one of the first spaces that came to us that I was not even aware existed is micromarkets. What are micromarkets? They are tiny honor system break rooms. Uh, where employees are typically putting a couple dollars of cash in a bucket and taking some power bars or a, a drink or a fruit, that sort of thing. They're kind of a vending machines, open air vending machines. Yeah. Uh, and they're replacing vending machines at a very rapid rate. Interesting. 40% year over year growth in the micro market space why in the do US. You, why do you think vending machines are going away? They're, they're pretty convenient. Um, they're relatively expensive. You have to own the machine. You have to maintain it. It has a footprint. It uses electricity all of the time. Um, it's a lot of uh, infrastructure to prevent loss. And in an environment like an office, you don't need that infrastructure, right? Everybody is an employee. Nobody really wants to risk their job playing games with stuff. Right, right. Interesting. So these open air markets, uh, and was there a specific company or were there just lots of companies all at once that uh, started <laughs> using future proof for, for these micro markets? Um, we started getting a group of inquiries. Uh, the very first one was not a micro market operator, but just a person who actually had a shared workspace and they just wanted it to be available to their, yeah. uh, you know, people in the office. Um, and that one was in LA and now we do a lot of work with natural source snacks out of Canada. They're a fantastic micro market operator in Vancouver. Uh, and they focus very much on doing uh, such healthy snacks that people are feeling fitter and more focused and working better while they're at the office. It's a wonderful idea. Uh huh. Are any of these micro markets at the co working spaces here in the city? Uh, no, I don't believe there's any micro markets in New York. Uh huh. Uh, the only stores in New York at the moment are the Fairway uh, Market chain. But still, you're very global. You said Hong Kong, you said Belgium. Yep. Um, so, so Hong Kong was our first fashion stores and Belgium first convenience. Uh, we're in the Spar brand and OK brand uh, in a pilot with the Colerit group there. Actually, Hong Kong is not a difficult place to do business with, with uh. because everybody speaks English. It's a very business friendly city. Things happen very quickly there. Yeah. Um, in a lot of ways, Hong Kong is similar to New York. Interesting. Uh, I wouldn't think people should feel worried about trying to, you know, get into business in Hong Kong. Have you gone over there? Yes. Do you like it? Yeah, very much. I would imagine so. Um, yeah, I would love to go. I, I, I dream of doing a startup hunt uh, episode over there. Oh, there's good places for you to go on a walk there. I like the progress of this interview. We're always making forward progress. Yes. Feels good to be uh, walking. Yeah, I'm glad you like it. So you've expanded to a lot of countries. You just started um, doing revenue 18 months ago. What, do you think you're going to do the um, startup route, you know, 4.4 million, or you're going to do a series A or B or C, you know, try and go public? Like, what's your long-term strategy? We are open to a couple of different long-term strategies. Our focus is always on delivering the best experience. And in this sector, what we do, mobile self-scanning, there have been many very unsuccessful attempts, uh, starting with Walmart's attempts, uh, I think maybe about 10 years ago, uh, which they then canceled. And they later moved that and modified that, and now that's the Sam's Club Scan and Go app, which is very successful. In fact, it's the most successful app besides ours that's been deployed at a uh, retailer for uh -huh. frictionless checkout. But there have been many other cases where it did not work out. Effort involved in changing a behavior for the consumer that is as fundamental as shopping. Something we learn, you know, at four years old, walking into a store with our parents, that same flow has been in place since the barcode in the 70s, right? Uh, that's a habit that's difficult to shake. And I've even noticed in myself, I walk into a grocery store environment, I'm standing under a giant TV playing an ad for the app. I didn't even see it and it's our app. Yeah. So uh, 
making the program successful is really the, the main thrust of what we do and making it something that can be used in a variety of retail environments. So we're always trying to improve the base shopping experience, make it faster, make it easier. Um, and then we're also trying to tailor it more for some of the different niches that we are addressing now. And our goal overall is universality. We want to be basically anywhere a product with a barcode is being sold for now. In wrapping this up, one question that I've started to ask, which is really my signature question, I think it's the most important question, is over these last five years of running your own business, what ways do you think you've grown as an entrepreneur? I think I've improved most in the area of communication. First, that was just learning that communication is a much more important skill than I ever realized. As somebody who came from loving computers and video games and doing activities, you know, that, that had structure and rules like games or that were, you know, like code where, where things happen or they don't, but it's predictable. And moving to communication where you need to collaborate with large groups of people. Sometimes you're collaborating through somebody to somebody else. And so you don't even hear their concerns directly. Um, sometimes you write something to one person and it gets forwarded to seven other people and becomes the thesis of an argument you didn't even realize you were making, uh, the framing of everything. I think that if I look at what skill I wish or what skill could have accelerated us earlier in the beginning, I think it would have been understanding more about how to connect with our clients and uh, how to work through bigger organizations to make this kind of technological and operational change happen. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm, I'm glad you're uh, becoming aware of that. How big is your team now? Uh, today we're 10 people Fits and we vary in size. Uh, sometimes if we have a big project, uh, we might staff up with contractors in order to get over the hump of an initial launch. Do you have an office? Yeah, our office is on uh, 29th Street. I would encourage anyone who is watching this in New York and uh, is enjoying it to go and try the Fairway app. It's called Fairway Mobile Checkout on the App Store. You'll be able to check yourself out instantly anytime. This is a, this is a global show. Where else should people go? Uh, if you're in Hong Kong, check out the Scan and Go stores there. If you're in Vancouver, well, you probably got to be invited by a friend to their office to try one of the micro markets. Uh, in Chicago, try any of the Plum Market locations, especially the micro market locations. California, there's California Fresh Market, uh, El Rancho Market, uh, Goodwins, Co Opportunity. If you happen to be in Belgium, check it out at one of the Spar or the OK stores there. Very cool. It sounds like a really amazing global existence uh, that you're living. <laughs> uh, I live it from New York. It's, yeah. a, it's a local existence for me. Yeah. Um, but I think that's the beauty of software. And I think it's also, if I had to really say thank you to, to two people uh, for, well, really the three people for making this possible. The first is my partner, Didi. The thing that makes any business like this possible is managing stress levels and teamwork and cooperation and enthusiasm. And that enthusiasm is a resource just like money and time and most startups die when they run out of it. Yes. And having the best partner I could ever hope for uh, has been absolutely necessary to our start. Yeah. Uh, then I have to say, holy thanks to the people producing these fantastic smartphones. When we got started back in 2014, the phones were not that great at scanning barcodes. And now you can hold it up to a wall of barcodes and they'll all scan instantly. Amazing. And it's not because of our efforts, it's just the cameras and the processors and, uh, and this is what enables it. And then finally also to Josh K. Because yeah. <laughs> I would not be making mobile apps, we wouldn't be following this path uh, if he hadn't reached out to me and, and we'd become friends all that time ago. Josh has curlier hair than David, as I recall. Yes. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Hunter. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you coming on too. Thanks.